today's top boxing news. Ow! Okay, we'll start with this. You may have heard that the show will go on for former champion Ivana Habazin of Croatia. Even if she's not fighting Jessica McCaskill, she will still be fighting. It will still be for not only the WBC title, but WBA interim status at 147 pounds. She'll be taking on Hungary's own Kinga Magyar. 28 years old to Ivana Habazin, who's 34. Kinga Magyar sports a professional record of 14 wins with four losses, no draws, six knockouts. Having been knocked out two times in 18 professional bouts, those losses happened very early in Kinga Magyar's career. We're talking about in the first five or so fights. She's currently on a 13-fight winning streak. A few years younger than Ivana. Ivana Habazin, the more experienced fighter of the two, the more seasoned fighter of the two, who sports a professional record of 22 wins with five losses, no draws, seven knockouts, having been knocked out once, just once in 27 professional bouts. Just saying something because she's been in there with a lot of good fighters. Terry Harper, Clarissa Shields, Cecilia Brakus, Michaela Lauren. She's been in there with a lot of good fighters. She's gonna be in there with Kenga Magyar very soon in what is her bid to become a two-time welterweight champion years ago. She did used to hold the IBF title, but Cecilia Brakus beat her and took it from her. This is her chance to become a champion again. The fight is happening in Ivana's neck of the woods in her native Croatia. She'll have home field advantage. Having last seen action in September of last year, she fought two times last year, only once the year before. Something very similar applies to Kinga Magyar. She last saw action in December of last year. She fought two times last year and only once the year before. But that's essentially saying that both these fighters have seen action in the last 12 months, and neither one of them will have any ring rust or cobwebs they need to shake off. This fight is flying largely under the radar. Irrespective of who wins, whether it's Ivana or Kenga, the virtue of it is seeing a new champion crowned at this weight, and then seeing that champion unify titles with one or some of the other champions at this weight, whether it's the winner of Terry Harper versus Sandy Ryan, set to go down this weekend. For the WBO. The winner of the McCaskill versus Lauren Price fight for the WBA or this division's reigning IBF champion Liverpool's own Natasha Jonas who's stuck out there without a dance partner right now this fight is going down in April whoever wins could meet Natasha Jonas over the summer months there's plenty of time being realistic that's where the real money is. That's where the real money is for the winner of this fight, whether it's Kinga or Ivana. The real money comes when they go to unify titles with somebody else, with a fighter, fighters that actually have a major promotional outfit behind them and network money. This is a fight of some consequence, even if it's flying low under the radar. Most fight fans are not all that familiar with Ivana Habazin, in spite of her having been around for so many years and fought so many familiar fighters, familiar faces, they're not that familiar with her, and even less of them are familiar with Kinga Magyar. We're gonna have to give a closer look. It's a fight of some consequence, and the real money for the winner will be in unifying titles with some of the other champions at the weight. There's also former champion Michaela Mayer, who's stuck out there without a dance partner. It doesn't look like a Jonas rematch is happening right now. If Top Rank is still invested, in the career of Michaela Mayer, and I'm not sure if they are, but if they are, it would behoove them to secure her the winner of this fight so that she can get her hands on that belt, so that she can become a two-division champion. She got jobbed in her last fight, I'm just being honest. She got robbed. She beat Natasha Jonas, but she didn't get the decision. She should have. I don't really think the people at Boxer want to make a rematch between Natasha and Michaela. Natasha was very fortunate to keep her alphabet title in that fight. I don't think Michaela's on Lauren Price's radar or Jessica McCaskill's radar. Maybe she's on Sandy Ryan's. Maybe she's on Terry Harper's. I just think getting a fight with the winner of Habazin versus Magyar is a more negotiable situation than those situations. If Top Rank cares to do it, but that's the question. How invested is Top Rank in Michaela at this point in the juncture? She's coming off her second professional loss. I don't know. What I do know is the winner of Habazin versus Magyar, whoever it is, they're going to have options. They're going to have a lot of options. We'll talk more about the fight as the fight date approaches.
Men's junior middleweight news, former WBC interim champion Sebastian Fundoria says, if I could fight Crawford, Spence, or Pacquiao, I'd do it. I believe him. But it would be less than ideal. In truth, the fight that he's about to have is less than ideal. Coming to him at less than ideal circumstances, he's coming off that knockout loss to Brian Mendoza. Now, Fundora is focused on Sergey Bohachu, his former sparring partner, and he has dreams of the top names in the sport afterwards. If I could fight the Terrence Crawford, if I could fight the Errol Spences, if I could fight, say, a Manny Pacquiao, whoever it is, I'll do it, added Fundora. If all goes well for Fundora, he might not just be a super welterweight world champion with his willingness to land high-profile fights and the ability to move up in the weight classes. I have height to go up in weight, Fundora told Boxing Scene. If I ever need to go up in weight to fight the Canelos or whatever, not that I would move up to super middleweight right now. He's got the frame to do it, but does he have the talent? Does he have the ability? I've long maintained that in spite of Sebastian Fundora's statuesque frame, he doesn't manage distance as well as he should for someone as tall and someone as long, long and limber as he is. He immediately gives up his height to trade punches mid-range to inside, and that worked for him for a time. But I said it here on this channel. That's going to backfire. Sooner or later, he's going to run into somebody that's throwing shorter punches mid-range to inside than he is, and he's going to pay for it. He did. He found that out with Brian Mendoza. Got knocked out. I have the hike to go up in weight, Fundora told Boxing Scene. If I ever need to go up in weight to fight the Canelos or whatever, not that I would move up to super middleweight right now, but if the opportunity shows, I will definitely take it. I will make my mark in the history books of boxing. Fundora, age 26, is training near Bakersfield, California, and he holds a record of 20 wins with one loss, one draw, 13 knockouts. He's had the look of a mid-range to inside pressure fighter, volume puncher, up until this point. I don't know that he's decided to change things ahead of this Sergei Bohachuk fight, but he needs to because his base style, to me, seems more of a cop-out. What? A guy with that much height and that much reach. Boxing mid-range to inside. It seems like a cop-out to me. Why? Because he can't manage the distance mid-range to outside because he struggles to keep his opponent at arm's length. With the jab. Managing the distance. I caught a glimpse of that in the Carlos Ocampo fight. At the start... You saw Sebastian Fundora trying to manage the real estate with straight punches and using the jab, but he looked uncomfortable and inefficient. It seemed like something he was struggling with. And then as the fight progressed, he got back to doing what he normally does, crowding the pocket, letting go of hooks. He capped out. He has the height and reach to be a formidable long-distance fighter, long-range fighter, but he primarily operates in the pocket, mid-range to inside, and at that proximity, the shorter fighter with the shorter arms... Not the taller fighter has the advantage within close quarters the shorter fighter with the shorter arms can get off their punches faster because they don't need as much room to work the taller fighter does Sebastian Fundora in most every single situation you can think of at junior middleweight is the taller fighter yeah and I speculated for a long while here on the channel that sooner or later that's gonna backfire constantly giving up your height and your length to these smaller opponents I mean it's one thing to acquaint yourself with infighting inside fighting but it's quite another to always resort to that and he always does because of his statuesque frame and his long arms at that proximity there are openings he's giving them away sebastian is a young fighter so there's still time to patch up those holes the problem is this is a less than ideal opponent to try and do that with sergey bohachuk he's a puncher you just got knocked out knocked out hard now you're fighting another hard puncher. Even if it is for the WBC title. It is a less than ideal situation. Has enough time passed in between the Mendoza fight and what's supposed to be the Bohachuk fight that Sebastian will have tightened up. Because he needs to. Set to go down on the end of card of Zhu versus Thurman. Zhu versus Thurman that the good people at the Boxing Voice are now saying is in jeopardy. What? The Boxing Voice tweeted via their social media account, wow, horrible news. Multiple sources have confirmed to me that Keith Thurman has an MRI scheduled today for a potential bicep injury. I'm told MRI results will determine if the fight is canceled or if it happens. My thoughts. Believe it or not, I've been hearing rumors for weeks now that this fight might get canceled. Though it had nothing to do with a bicep tear or an MRI or anything like that. I'd been hearing rumors this thing might get called off 
for at least a month now. I don't think the tickets are selling too good. I mean, come on. A two years inactive Keith Thurman versus an Australian national who most Americans aren't familiar with headlining a show. A pay-per-view. I've been hearing for a while now that this thing might get called off, and we know there's been a lack of promotion, the overall lack of promotion. We heard so much about the marketing arm of Amazon, how they have so many subscribers. You no, know, they haven't spent much of any time marketing this fight to all of those subscribers. And on that premise, I heard rumors for a while now that this fight might get called off. I did. At the same time, looking at the other side of it, you're talking about a fighter in Keith Thurman who's in his mid-30s. He's been injury prone as long as I can remember snapping back to activity after a two-year hiatus from the sport. Given his current physical condition, it's entirely possible that he injured himself. That the injury is legitimate? It's possible that it is. I only wonder if the fight ends up getting called off. Does the whole card end up getting called off? Or will they promote Romero versus Cruz up to the main event? Will the show go on or will the whole show get canceled? I think it's unfortunate for Tim. And I think the people at the PBC and just whatever it is they have going on, they're wasting his time. As far back as last year, I can remember plans to have Tim Zhu fight somebody in Vegas. They wanted Tim Zhu's fight to run parallel next to another event happening in Vegas in reference to the Australian Rugby League. They were expecting a lot of Aussies to be in town as a result of that rugby event, and they wanted to stage Tim's fight at or around that time. They didn't get to do that. They were negotiating with Erickson Lubin. One thing led to another. They didn't get to do that. Talks for a Lubin fight turned into talks for a Keith Thurman fight that was not well received. And here we are. The fight might get called off, but will the entire card get called off? It might. Further accenting the instability over there at the PBC and what's supposed to be their kickoff card on Amazon Prime, it's not looking good. People get mad at me whenever I point that out, but there's no nice way for me to say any of this stuff. It's too much instability over there. You're blaming the PBC because Keith Thurman is injured? No, I'm blaming inactivity on his injury, and his inactivity is a direct byproduct of the PBC. Guy in his mid-30s who hasn't fought in two years, what do you expect? It doesn't have to be a conspiracy. It doesn't have to be a clandestine effort to pull Keith Thurman out of this fight. It doesn't have to be. It's entirely possible that he really is injured. That doesn't make the situation any better, does it? Tim Zhu's got to stop dealing with these people. I don't know why he's doing it. He's got to stop dealing with these guys. Go to top rank. Go to match room. They have ties to the Australian market. They have Australian fighters. Stop dealing with these people! Finally, in men's heavyweight news, former two-division champion Andre Ward details what was supposed to be his plan to move up to heavyweight after the Kovalev fight to take on Anthony Joshua, saying, I never had problems with a bigger man. Andre Ward almost fought Anthony Joshua and Tony Bellew, but made the shock decision to retire. Ward's career was frustrating at times as he became super middleweight king by conquering the Super 6 tournament, but then had an extended period out of the ring due to a contractual dispute, despite missing out on a piece of his prime, he returned at light heavyweight and twice beat Russian star Sergei Kovalev to establish himself as the best fighter in the sport, albeit for a short while. It was after stopping Kovalev in their dramatic rematch that Ward sat down as a free agent. The way up his next move. One option was to move up the cruiserweight 200 pounds to pursue Tony Bellew and then chase greatness by leaping up to heavyweight for a clash with Anthony Joshua. Why not Adonis Stevenson? You were a free agent. If you were a free agent, there was nothing stopping you from going over to the PBC side of things to pursue that fight. He was after the money. Why do you think he was looking at Tony? Why do you think he was looking at Anthony? In the end, Ward opted to retire instead. It was something that was talked about on and off as my career was winding down, Ward explained to Gareth A. Davies on Talk Sport. If I would have continued fighting, absolutely, no doubt about it, at my post-fight press conference after the Kovalev rematch, Virgil Hunter mentioned it. He mentioned it. There was literally nothing left for me to do at 175 pounds. Adonis Stevenson, I don't believe he deserved a shot. But you believe David Benavidez deserves a shot at Canelo? Adonis Stevenson was a more accomplished fighter then than David Benavidez is now. Funny how that works. I just fought the biggest name in a division. I'm not going backwards, so there was nothing left at 175. Bullshit. If I'd stayed around, it was going to be at cruiserweight. I was going to target Tony Bellew. I know he would have took the fight. And once I'd left that at 200 pounds and got my feet underneath me, I would have gone after Anthony Joshua. If he would have took it 
Seriously? I don't know. But that's who we were gunning for. Ward is adamant that he would have been confident of beating Joshua despite the size disadvantage. This is no disrespect to Anthony Joshua, Ward continued, but I just feel that way about it. I've never had problems with bigger men. Ever. Bullshit. I've been a middleweight facing light heavyweights, heavyweights. I've never had problems with taller and more physically bigger men in the boxing ring. Bullshit. In fact, I welcome that. What's more challenging is a skillful fighter, a guy who makes me think the way I make him think. If you stand in the way of Joshua's straight right hand as a smaller man, even as a bigger man, you've got problems, no doubt about that. There are things I would have had to figure out and overcome. Sounds to me like Gus saying he's not skillful. But you are. You weren't too skillful to stay out of the way of Darnell Boone's homing missile. Darnell Boone, veteran journeyman Darnell Boone, who landed a hard right hand on Andre Ward that sat him on his face. Hard jab from Sergey Kovalev sat him on his ass. But you'd think you'd have the chops to go in there with Anthony Joshua, who's a lot bigger, and I mean a lot bigger, than those guys. He ain't gotta hit you but once. Comprendo, friendo. Ward continued. At that stage in my career, I'd conquered 168, I'd conquered 175, I was going up to cruiserweight, and if I'm successful against Bellew, I'm going to the mountaintop. I don't see a problem with me fighting and beating Joshua because I would have worn him down. Yeah, right. I'm not standing there for you to hit me, and if you did land, I believe I would have took the right hand. <laughs> I was going to find a way, and I think it would have been a lot easier than people realize. So easy that you didn't do it. You have to understand that if Andre would have got that opportunity at that time, he would have made more money in that fight than he made in both Sergey Kovalev fights. Without winning. He wouldn't have won. He wouldn't have. He can say this and that to whoever's listening, but the reality of it is, Andre Ward at his very best was a mid-range to inside fighter, and not a particularly strong one. You weren't going to dominate the pocket with Anthony. And you weren't going to put a dent in him either. You needed two fights with Sergey Kovalev at light heavyweight. Two fights for one conclusive victory. The first fight, a lot of people will tell you, Andre lost. If Anthony lands a jab on you like Sergey landed a jab on you, you're gonna go down. Oh yeah, but you're gonna stay down. Kovalev dropped you with a jab. A fucking jab at light heavyweight. What do you think happens if Anthony hits you? Give me a break. Don't sit here talking to me years later, talking about how easy it would have been or people don't realize how easy it would have been. If you really thought that it was easy, you would have done it. You didn't do it. Stop it. You left unfinished business at super middleweight. You didn't conquer that division. You didn't become undisputed and you didn't become undisputed at light heavyweight either. Conquer? Cut the fucking crap. Anthony's buzzing right now and you just want to steal his thunder. You wanted to steal it then? You want to steal it now. That's all it is.